Okay, so my name is Andrew Schultz, and uh, the talk is kind of strange because as a PhD student, you try and come up with three chapters, and I have like mechanics materials of the elephant trunk, and then we kind of tacked on conservation at the end. So that's why you see the parentheses and conservation question mark here. So let's see how we, let's go back to this. Cool. So this is what I do um, with a lot of the experiments I perform, is I work with Zoo Atlanta and we design pretty simple experiments such as an elephant elongating to grab some food and observe what kind of behavior and what kind of uh, movement is actually happening with the elephant trunk. So this is actually taken at about 250 frames per second. So we can slow things down a lot so we can see some of the really cool behaviors happening. So I'm a fourth year PhD student. There's a picture of me in Bella Bell and Popo, South Africa. So I've gotten to do field work um, right before COVID hit. So I was supposed to go back last summer, but uh, not bummed about it at all. But uh, this was uh, one of the most terrifying photos I've ever taken because they're like, oh, these elephants are trained and yeah, just take a picture in front of it and um, I wouldn't smile. So there was about 700 pictures of me looking terrified and then one um, where they actually caught me smiling. So outside of doing elephant research, I also work on volunteer work. So this is me as an intern on the left doing foot care with African elephants at the zoo. So elephants will um, in captivity actually develop kind of these sort of calluses on their foot. So you have to wear those down so their pad is able to walk around uh, the habitat. And then we worked on things like biomechanics day at the zoo, which worked with teachers to bring biomechanics to the classroom. And then I was a docent. Um, it might be difficult to see um, by this picture, but it was really cool. I, I'm 26 and every other docent that started was an average age of 70. So they really like to talk about how I could have been their great grandchildren. It was pretty fun sort of class to do. Um, outside of that, I teach. So this is a picture uh, of my class Last spring, um, before COVID struck, we got to go on a visit to the zoo, and a lot of these students are working on different conservation projects. And so we have engineers, literature, media, communication majors, as well as scientists all working together to help advance elephant conservation and a lot of other species as well. Outside of uh, research, uh, as a Georgia Tech student, research is like 98% of my life, unfortunately, and sleep is 1%. And then the other 1% is I like to do hop keto, which is a South Korean martial art. Uh, and you can see um, when I mix class and hop keto, sometimes it does not go well for my students. So this is me where I got to invite one of my students to hop keto class and he never came again and did not enroll in class this semester. So I don't think that uh, went as well as I thought. And my love for elephants started, my mom has worked on power systems in electrical engineering for my entire life. And one of the things we were working on is bringing uh, some different power systems and microgrids to Kruger National Park in South Africa. So this is my delightful high school bracers phase that went, uh, went, and went all too quickly. Uh, and this is where I originally saw elephants at the uh, age of 17. And it's kind of uh, sparked my love for my research. So why are you here? Elephants are this fancy word is bio-inspiration. And when we think of bio-inspiration, what we do is we look at animals, like we looked at animals like birds to fly. and we gain inspiration to actually take to the skies from them. And so this is a, from Festo Corporate. They have a bionic handling assistant that's purely based on the movement and flexibility of the trunk. And that's one of the things that I'm looking at is how can we increase the function of these robots based on observations we can make of the trunk. So one of the terms that I will, it's, it's, they told me to avoid jargon, but one of the terms that I hope y'all will learn today is muscular hydrostat. So what a muscular hydrostat is, is it's all of these things. It's, it's different types of purely mus muscular uh, organisms and appendages where if you look at an elephant trunk, it's all muscle. It doesn't have any bones, it doesn't have any joints, it doesn't have any uh, of those types of hard structures, it's much like one of our tongues or an octopus tentacle. So what that's led to is these different types of bio-inspired robotics that have this flexibility and strength that a lot of the things in biology have as well. So muscular hydrostats have four basic movements. And these are some videos of different experiments we've done over time. So elongation, when they're reaching objects, shortening. So we'll talk about it today. But elephants can actually suction water. And they uh, shorten their trunk. We have uh, bending or wrapping around different objects and then twisting. So elephants can sweep up large groups of objects. So all these things are very simple experiments. but 
as engineers and scientists, what we can do is we can look at using equipment like a force plate or like high-speed cameras to actually be able to collect data and understand what's going on. So now I'm going to go into a little bit of anatomy and some fun facts that you can impress people with. So elephants use their trunks for five main tasks. So breathing, one of my favorite things is you can see elephants that will actually breathe um, when they go through really deep water. They breathe using their trunks. They'll use them actually as snorkels. Sound production, they can communicate with other elephants uh, kilometers away, and they actually use infrasonic frequency sound, things that we can't even hear, and they detect those because they have such large bones, their entire bones vibrate. Touch, so this is a, a cute picture of, it's called the trunk shake. When elephants meet, after a long time, they do this trunk shake, and it's called a reunion. And a prank that they pull when you do field work with elephants is a reunion is this beautiful thing that happens like in Lion King with all the elephants jumping up and down. Uh, what they didn't tell me is they all urinate and defecate immediately during, a, um, during one of these reunions and it goes everywhere. So I was initiated uh, successfully by being covered in that uh, one of the first days I was in South Africa. Olfaction, elephants can actually sniff bombs at higher rates um, as, uh, as bomb sniffing dogs. And finally, manipulation. So, as a scientist, we look back at what literature has happened and what has been published. And what I had to go on was this hand drawing from 1908. So they said, start here, tell us what you can do with an elephant trunk. And that's, I didn't have a lot to go on when I started this project. And finally, the difference between Asian and African elephants is African elephants have these two fingers on the tip of their trunk, which makes them a lot more interesting in terms of robotics. Because if you've ever tried to like do anything like grab toilet paper with only uh, your four fingers and not a thumb, it's a little difficult. So they have an added kind of benefit to that. So I don't want to go too much into this, but an elephant has all of these muscles. So you've probably heard elephants have 40,000, 110,000 muscles. We don't know. But what we do know is they can be categorized in three different categories. Longitudinal muscles, they help them stretch. Radial muscles, they control the these two nasal passages they have, and oblique muscles, which give them kind of left to right movement. So those are the three main muscle groups that you can see in the shades of pink. And then all of this is controlled by this giant nerve cord that goes right through the middle, right underneath these two nostrils. So what we're going to start with is mechanics. So when we look at something at like a meter scale, so that's similar to what, how you see me now. If we look at a meter scale, how is the elephant actually moving and how is it interacting with its environment? Then if we get a little closer, and this is a close-up picture of the skin and that folded and wrinkled skin that everyone thinks is really common with the elephant, at one centimeter, what does this look like? And we can even go to a millimeter or a micrometer. So this is the individual fibers that are inside of that skin. And we can gain different knowledge of how the trunk's able to move and interact um, with different objects and different things like water by looking at these different scales. But <laughs> My, my grandparents got me a gift. Uh, as an elephant researcher, the first thing you learn is your family immediately gets you every elephant thing they can possibly find from thrift stores and stuff, and it's uh, unique. So I have like a little elephant shrine in my room. And one of the things that got me my first year was this poster that was like, well, um, the good news is, is if we don't do conservation on these elephant species, they'll be far extinct by the time that we have grandchildren. And that bugged me because I was looking at this really, really awesome animal for inspiration, but I wasn't working on any of the conservation of the species. So that's what led me into working on some things of, we have these things like terms like endangered, vulnerable, and we have this mass extinction going on, but how can we work on mitigating things like the ivory trade and habitat loss and fragmentation of an elephant? And how can we get students involved in doing this outside of just thinking in terms of bio-inspired design? Cool. So let's get started. So an elephant approaches a barbell. This was um, kind of one of the first experiments that I did when I started at Tech of what would happen, what, what type of physics is actually going on when, when an elephant approaches a barbell. So it's exactly what we did. We worked with keepers from the zoo and we trained uh, Kelly, who was a 38-year-old now, 38-year-old at the time, 34, female African elephant, and we trained her to lift. So we looked at things like, okay, uh, less heavy, like 20 kilograms, just a bar, so 45 pounds. What actually happens? And, and Kelly had a pretty easy time with this. 
and it looks like a very simple experiment, but what we did is we actually drew chalk lines, and we can track that chalk line in terms of time. But as we got to really high weights, we were really surprised, and she kind of stopped reaching unless we gave her a ton of food. So what we found is that taking the like eight or nine weights, weight classes that we looked at, elephants can only lift about 150 pounds using their trunk, which is, you've probably seen these videos of elephants lifting 400 pound uh, logs and such, but what they have to do with that is a lot of times use their head and a lot of times they're charging. So they have to have that added kind of momentum to be able to lift that much. And when we look at one of these lifts, you can see here, this is the chalk lines that are going throughout one of the lifts. And uh, this is actually a really, really sad picture because I worked for like seven or eight months for this experiment to happen. And during this experiment, Kelly was having so much fun, she threw the barbell down and uh, sheared through about two inches of solid steel. So we are done with this experiment um, for quite a while, but it really was one of the ways we understood and kind of had that grasp of how powerful elephants are for when they're lifting some of these heavier weights. And if you're familiar with this, I just think this is fascinating. When on ships, there's something known as a capstan problem, which is you wrap more and more around these kind of like ship pillars, um, the wooden uh, stocks of the ship, and you can generate more and more force as you wrap more, and we see exactly the same. So these two lines are that model, that physics model plotted, and we see very similar trends. So as elephants lift, and they lift these heavier and heavier weights, we see them wrapping more and more, almost up to 400 degrees for these heavier weights. And they're actually lifting very similarly to a capstan, which is pretty fascinating that they're able to regulate some of that. Uh, some of that. So the last thing about this sort of sub-story is if you look at humans, and as humans lift heavier and heavier weights, they approach like a one rep maximum. I'm not somebody that frequents uh, a gym, but apparently if you do, as you go to heavier and heavier weights, you can only do one rep. So you can only do kind of one of these lifts. And we see that exact same behavior with elephants is power. As they're lifting heavier and heavier weights, they first increase so they can, it's really easy for them and they're not having to actually try very hard. But then it decreases as it approaches, like we talked about before, that 65 kilogram or about 150 pound level. And what is, this, what is this actually doing? Why are we doing all this? How does it apply to robotics? And the truth is, for this first experiment, it doesn't have a ton of applications to robotics. But what it does do is we didn't really know anything about the elephant trunk. So we had to start from somewhere. And this is where we started in terms of understanding some of what uh, the elephant's actually able to do. So now I want to go to something that was recently published where, okay, well, everybody knows elephants interact with water and elephants suction up water. This is a picture uh, taken in uh, Kenya by one of our collaborators that does field work there. And they're able to suction water, but they're also able to suction up food. So one of the things that is fascinating, we think about 150 pounds that we talked about before. So let's look at something that weighs one one thousandth of that amount. So a uh, 0.1 pound tortilla chip, it's technically a, a tostada, so it is a flat, it's not a tortilla chip, but that is, uh, I guess, some of the, the discrepancies that we had to use because elephants with a tortilla chip, it's, it's too tiny for us to actually observe. And this is a tortilla chip on top of, and if you see, she's struggling to pick it up, then she actually suctions it to her trunk. And by suctioning it to her trunk, she can, she's able to do this movement without breaking it. So. What this is called is it's called suction feeding. And so this is a fish, and it has one of these, fish are weird, they have these protruding jaws, and this is the, the food, and it might be difficult to see, but they actually suction up water and then release it through their gills in order to grab these types of objects. And we see elephants are able to do very similar things. But to start to understand this as a fluid mechanics person, what you want to do is you want to visualize how the fluid is moving when an elephant's drinking something like this. But we couldn't use beads that are apparently are like radiotoxic for the elephant. So what we had to do is use chia seeds, which was one of the keeper, keepers um, of the elephant's um, idea. And this is just some of how we started to understand how these elephants are able to drink these types of fluids. And what they can do is they can actually drink about three liters of water in a second. And because we're at a brewery, that's the equivalent of about a six pack in a second. So they are really just going through things. 
And then this is a bottom-down view using a high-speed camera. And we wanted to look at what is actually happening at the nostrils. How are these nostrils actually behaving? And what we found is, if we zoomed in on the nostrils, I'm going to watch this again, we saw that the nostrils are actually increasing in diameter, which is weird because they shouldn't be doing that. If you think of like suctioning or using a straw, when you drink using the straw, the straw doesn't change in diameter. It doesn't make it larger. And what we were able to do is we worked with the vet at the zoo, and this is just like an ultrasound for um, if, you're, uh, if you're pregnant. So we looked at doing ultrasound on the actual nostril, and what we found is the nostril is dilating. And these nostrils are actually increasing in size for elephants as they're suctioning. And this increase in size actually increases the volume of the trunk by about 60%. So they can go from drinking about five to six liters of water almost up to drinking nine liters of water. So they can suction for about three seconds. And it's pretty miraculous to think about that all of those muscles are not only able to elongate, shorten, all of those things, but things are actually also happening internally to the trunk as they're doing some of these different types of movements. And I just love this video. This is a video of um, elephants eating uh, apple cubes and uh, chia seeds underwater. But it's where you can really see how they're able to use suction and suction up these apple cubes inside the water. And they, they do both things. So they use those two fingers at the tip of their trunk and they, uh, and they use suction in order to grab. So very similar to that fish video that we saw earlier where elephants are actually suction feeding in terms of very similar to fishes. So the third story I want to talk about in terms of this elephant mechanics portion is on uh, the last research that we've done um, and we've gotten to actually finally go back to the zoo and do some of it uh, post COVID and something as simple as looking how an elephant reaches. So the very first slide we had showed this high speed video and it might look like a really good video, but it's really difficult for us to see things. The trunk kind of blends in with the background, so we can't track it very well. And um, also, uh, we did this with Masholo, who's the 30-year-old um, male. And immediately, when we started the test, we realized that uh, he's capable of a lot more than uh, we thought he was. And so a lot of times, when he interacts with things like this box that has food on top of it, he doesn't like reaching to grab the food. He just likes taking the box with him. So it makes some of these experiments a lot more challenging. So when we rethought of this, we figured out a way of stacking two boxes and moving them further away, and then also using a black tarp in the background for our actual experiments. So this is just a simple illustration of what that looks like. And um, I, I overuse this all the time, but it's my favorite thing. So elephants can stretch by about 20 to 25%. And it doesn't, when I heard that, I was kind of disappointed. I didn't think that was a lot. But then um, my advisor told me to look at it in terms of like human height. And it's the equivalent of growing from about five foot two to six foot eight. So it's even larger than the amount of height required for Kevin Hart to grow to the size of LeBron James. And when you think, of, and you see this is across several trials. So what that cloud shows is how much variability there is in terms of doing actual biological research with elephants. But this is how we actually take this data. So if you, it might be hard to see some of the colors here, but you can see green dots that don't move. So what we actually use is we use software, and if you think of old film, what it does is it looks through every single one of these images in a film, and it steps through each of the images, and it can track all of these positions and all of these wrinkles along the trunk in order to tell us how exactly the trunk is moving. But what I just showed you is how the entirety of the trunk is moving. And we can actually look at even smaller scales. So I'm going to use some terms. I tried to do my best to avoid jargon, but we're going to have a little lesson today. So I want everybody to put your left arm out. OK, okay so the distal tip of your arm is your fingers. The proximal part of your arm is where your shoulder is. And then the dorsal part of your arm is the top, like the top of your hand. Ventral part of your arm is the bottom part of your hand. So you can think of kind of the light area is the ventral portion. The dark area is the dorsal portion. And then the distal tip is fingers. So I'm going to use those terms. If you have questions about them afterwards, I'm happy to learn. Apparently, doctors use like Palmer 
instead of ventral, but I'm not doing that because I don't have a PhD yet. So um, again, one of the other parts that I'm going to talk about later is thinking of this wrinkled skin that is along the trunk. So we have our vocabulary defined for the rest of the slides. So like I said, we can look at this tracking, and this is what it actually looks like in the program. So you can see all of these different tracker dots we're able to track over the course of several hundred frames. And this is what the data looks like very simply, is you just kind of have this plot where you have an initial position, and then as it tracks, it changes that position over time. And by looking at that position over time, we can separate the trunk into these distal, proximal, mid-distal, mid-proximal sections. But this is really confusing. There's just so much data, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense in terms of, it looks really good maybe for scientists, but not even really, right? It's confusing. You have all of these things happening, and how can you understand what's actually happening during each of these time segments? So what we do is, if we're having difficulty visualizing data, we look at a different way to visualize that data. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a heat map. So a heat map is, this is those four different portions. So again, proximal, mid-proximal, mid-distal, and distal are here. And then what this is showing you is the amount of stretching each of those four portions are including. And then this is telling you how high they are. So what a heat map does is you can see kind of three different variables in two dimensions, if you will. So it's going to play through the video here, and this might be difficult to see. But you can see that the, the tip is starting to light up. And then as the reach is going on, it starts to move closer and closer to the base. So again, colors closer to red mean that it's stretching more. And what we see from here is the tip is not actually elongating a lot, but it's elongating first. So how this is actually happening is very similar to one of those toy lightsabers. It's like a telescope. So at the very top here, you can see the tip, everything is kind of the same. But then as the reach is going on, we can see it moves from the tip all the way back to the base. One of the reasons it's doing this is because of control, right? If you think of um, humans are lazy, right? Animals are lazy too. They don't want to expend too much energy in order to do something. So what they're doing is they're elongating their tip, which has about, let's say, a volume of one liter of muscle, or you can think of one pint. But as you get to this proximal base, it's about 12 to 15 of those pints. So what you want to do is you want to move the muscle that's smaller so you preserve your energy, and then later more and more. So if you think of holding like an ice cream cone right in front of your tongue, you're not gonna, you're gonna have to eventually move the ice cream back to you. So it is really fascinating they're moving in this very kind of distinct way. But one of the other things is elephants are just like humans. They have this different type of material on the top of their trunk versus the bottom. So if we look at the same thing and then we, we did not, well, I guess we did do this with the frozen trunk. We didn't do this with Kelly. We did not chop her trunk in half. But uh, if you look at the difference between the top and the bottom, you see vast differences. The top is getting much darker. And this doesn't really make sense. If you think of taking any like rubber band and you stretch the rubber band and then the top is moving more, you would always get like bending. But we don't see that. The trunk's always stretching forward. And you can see that here with the same sort of thing. And we talked some about scale. So this is a trunk that's about two, two and a half meters long. So it's huge. So to actually understand how the differences are going on, what we do is we actually look all the way at the skin. So this is a piece of skin that's about two centimeters across. And what we can do is we can do the exact same thing using the exact same technology. Right? We talked about those are the red dots. And then I'm going to click this. And you're going to see that as the skin is stretching on the dorsal or the top portion of the trunk, you see this one really large peak. And you see this yellow segment there. And what's happening is the elephant on the dorsal part or the top part has these really deep folds. So you kind of think of it like Kevlar with a little bend in it. But if you look at the ventral portion, it's, it's meant for gripping, just like our hands are, right? So it's very, very flexible. And it has all of these wrinkles, which actually help you grab types of objects. So not only are we sh seeing that there's differences in the top and the bottom of the trunk, but what those explanations of why those are so different is actually because of what's happening at the skin level. Okay. So 
I like to refer to the trunk as a uh, muscular multi-tool, which uh, is something um, my advisor is like, you can use that. Um, it's technically Dr. Hooves, so thank you, David, um, for that idea. But what the reason is, is it can kind of do almost like anything it wants. It can lift a 50 gram tortilla chip, and then you look at something that's literally a thousand times that weight, and it's able to lift one of those barbells with ease. But also, it uses these two nostrils inside of their trunk to drink water at three liters per second and air possibly at 150 meters per second, or liters per second. Then, if we look at its elongation, it can do all of this while having the skin that can bear stretching 25% and still being able to protect it from the elements or something like a lion attack. So, just in, the, in that five functions that a trunk can do, if we just focus on one, we see all of these different types of things that this muscle can do, which is what's made it really, really awesome. And where this applies to robotics is a new field of soft robotics has come, which is if you think of, I think like when a lot of people think robots, they think like Tin Man and the robot dance, and you have all these hard joints. But what soft robots are is they're much like a muscle where they have all soft types of materials, and that's where we're really looking at inspiration. So I myself work a lot with elephants and the physics and modeling behind it. I didn't want to show you any of the math, but uh, we're working with collaborators that are actually building some mimics as well as robots based on a lot of this movement. And I like to share this video because people think my job is great, and it is, but there are bad days. And this was a bad day with Misholo. So it's, it doesn't always go the way that you want it. And this is one of the frustrating parts, but also really interesting parts about working with animals is if you look at doing something like human biomechanics, when you look at humans, you can kind of say, jump as high as you can, run as fast as you can on this treadmill. But we can't always do that when we're looking at something like an elephant. So uh, we have to design experiments where we're thinking of the animal, but also where we can observe and we can actually test some of the hypothesis around what we're looking at. So I want to transition here to conservation and to talk about, so we're experiencing something that a lot of people are calling the great acceleration. And this is just the, this is the number of extinctions in terms of time intervals. And we see this exponential growth, but it's not just with extinctions, it's with everything, right? It's with GDKP, it's um, GKP, what? finance stuff. Um, but uh, it's also with things like climate change and looking at uh, the amount of people in the world and we're accelerating at an alarming rate. And a lot of this sort of collapse, if we think of animals going from least concern to critically endangered, even extinct, a lot of it is human caused, whether we like it or not. So. What I'm working on is trying to come up with a way, well, humans got ourselves into this mess, only we are the ones that can get ourselves out. So I wanna talk about conservation technology, which is this really annoying term, because it's what everybody uses, but when I hear it, I just think of like a drone is flying and it's like flying over a poacher and then it like, I don't know, shoots a dart at that poacher. And, and what that's known as is a lot of times it's called opportunistic technology. And what it means is you take something that's built for most of the time, the military, and you go, hey, we can use the same exact thing in conservation in some sort of type. But what we're working on is actually building things for the individual use cases. So what is conservation technology? Well, what I like to think of is it's like human dash wildlife center design. So if you think of when you came here today and you look at things that are hanging on trees or on billboards and stuff, we interact with all of the all of the nature around us in a lot of different ways. Whether it's using pesticides on farms, or it's even uh, hanging things from trees. Like Georgia, I keep saying that because Georgia Tech hung these like strings with really nice notes on them, and it was cool. But I I got a little upset because it was going to kill the squirrels. And so, like in walking to campus, I've seen about eight to ten dead squirrels that have choked on these because we didn't actually think about okay, well, as humans, we're living around this wildlife. How can we make sure the things that we're designing are actually keeping the wildlife in mind? So 
what conservation technology is, is it uses a combination of these things, genetics, monitoring, policy, and technology. So genetics, so I'm not sure if any of you like sushi, but uh, we have a tremendous issue actually in the United States and the world with uh, raw fish and mislabeling of raw fish. So what will happen is you actually, if you have something like tuna, what it might actually be is a much, uh, it might even be an endangered fish that has been colored um, or dyed to look like tuna. And so what, um, there's a researcher in New York that's actually looking at a table side genetics toolkit where you can test to see if the genetics of the fish is actually the exact same. Um, so chefs can actually look at uh, the genetics of each of uh, the fish that they're buying. Monitoring, this is something known as the audio moth. It's so cool. If you know what an Arduino is, it's this open source computing thing that actually can, you can put it anywhere and it'll tell you what birds are in the area. So they've used all of these fancy coding things that I don't really understand, and um, it's open source. So what they're looking at is collecting data to understand what types of birds are in all these different areas to understand migration patterns. Policy, so this picture is funny to me because when I show it to people, they're always like, oh my gosh, it's so cute, and then they realize that it's a lion head on a pedestal, and um, it's a little different. But this is something trophy hunting. Is it good, is it bad? Um, so in my opinion, and this is recorded so this is gonna go everywhere, it's actually necessary right now. Now, it's not necessary with endangered species, but with things like impala that are overpopulating a lot of the countries in Africa, it's necessary in order to conser conserve a lot of the other species and technology. So I love this picture. I love showing it to people that are from agriculture backgrounds because they hate the Impossible Burger, but um, one of, it's a generation um, topic. It's a topic that generates a lot of conservation cause, uh, uh, conversation because the Impossible Burger actually does more carbon emissions than a lot of good farm agriculture practices. So if you look at this, it's branded as being a conservation, you are doing good for the world if you're having an Impossible Burger. But if you actually look at what they're doing, they're actually doing it for all the wrong reasons and they're actually polluting more than looking at a lot of the beef industry. So what do we do? So at Tech, we started this new organization called Georgia Tech for Wildlife. And we have a team of about 22 students that are working on six projects. And these projects are ranging, like you heard in the intro, working with elephants, but we're also working with a lot of domestic projects. And I'm gonna highlight two of those, one of which at Georgia Tech and one is uh, at Pigeon Forge with the American Eagle Foundation. So. What we do is we get students together in this interdisciplinary class and I kind of talk to them about biology, engineering, and some of these techniques and then we design, test, and deliver these types of technologies to different conservation organizations throughout the world. So this is the one I'll start with. Um, tech students know this all too well. In 2019, we actually had um, a rabies outbreak on our native fox population and uh, I see some uh, heads nodding, and what happened is some foxes got rabies and they went around and bit a bunch of students, and then all those foxes actually had to be euthanized. Uh, and fun story about this, I was so nervous when I was giving my proposal presentation on blue jeans, I actually said they euthanized all the students, um, at, which was apparently a little bit of a misstep in terms of what I was trying to say. But what we're doing is we're working on what they do with coyotes in terms of vaccinating them, and we're using camera traps on campus to actually identify foxes and then we're combining that camera trap with something very similar to if you have an automated dog feeder and it actually vaccinates all of the uh, foxes on our campus. So if you think of working and living around urban carnivores, what we can do is without ever having a human set foot or have to trap that animal, we can keep all of those animals actually vaccinated without interacting with them. And we're doing some cool projects uh, actually working with European badgers in a very similar situation um, too. So, oh, did this die? Next slide, maybe. Cool. So this is the Mammals of Georgia Tech, um, which one of our students made. Um, it says a disgruntled graduate student there. But yeah, what, what was crazy is this is not even updated because the last one we did is we actually saw two coyotes are in, um, make uh, Georgia Tech home. So the Atlanta Coyote Foundation was actually really surprised that that far inside of uh, Georgia Tech and inside of Atlanta, we actually had coyotes. And 
we have all of these animals, right? Opossums, chipmunks. This is, uh, so I'll show you. If you can come up later, it's really cute. We got an, uh, a chipmunk that actually stuffed like four nuts into its mouth. And so it, it looks like one of those cartoons. But even domestic dogs and cats. And how can we live around these animals successfully and safely? And that's what this project's really looking at. Next slide, please. So the other project I want to talk about is what happens all too often in conservation. So we're working with the American Eagle Foundation and Pigeon Forge, and they uh, release a lot of bald eagles each year. So they're one of the organizations that really tried to help and save bald eagles in terms of starting, I believe, in the 80s. And uh, one of the things that they have to do is to get data, they have to release these eagles with some sort of tracker. So you see this little device here. Uh, and those trackers that they buy uh, are trackers that are used for the military, for um, a lot of soldiers and actually tracking soldiers when they're deployed in the field. So they cost casually, you know, four to $10,000 a piece. So if you think of releasing an eagle, and if you release hundreds of eagles a year, you need quite a lot of donations all sinking to these trackers. So I got to work with the senior design team. Next slide, please. And, and then click it one more time. And what they worked on is actually designing a, a, a device that can attach to not just eagles, but all birds of prey. So you'll see it here, and it's attached to the end. So it's about $50 to $75 per device. And this can actually track eagles throughout North America. So including uh, um, both uh, North America, uh, America as well as Canada, which is where I hibernate to. And they designed all of these things like a user interface and made it so even eagles that are diving into the water to catch prey can uh, get. Next slide, please. So just one more time, uh, if this is us doing flight testing in Pigeon Forge, but it was pretty cool because in just like six to eight weeks, we had students that were able to design something, next slide, that was able to uh, detect eagles as well as cost under um, what they wanted to. So. All of this work would not have been possible without, we have so many collaborators and so many people who have actually helped this be successful. So just to go through those, um, these are the six elephant keepers that we work with at the uh, Atlanta Zoo, Katie, Scott, Steve, Nate, Josh, and Caleb, and all have been contributing to a lot of the research I've done. And all like things like the chia seeds and stuff were a lot of their ideas in terms of coming up with those. Next slide, please. And. The class has really benefited from a large group of collaborators, and that's everyone from the Center for Teaching and Learning to different anatomists and engineers throughout the United Nations. Um, and they're, uh, they're, they have a cool, uh, it's called CITES, is the United Nations like branch that works on conservation. Um, and a lot of these people have been really helpful in terms of the class as well as a lot of those projects. Next slide. And then um, my students, uh, I, this is the t groups of 20 people that um, when I first started teaching, it was really fun. I went home to Washington and I, uh, my parents weren't necessarily prepared for COVID um, as none of us were. So I got to do the first few months of class from my parents' garage. Uh, so it was really exciting because it was Washington. Um, and so there was some times where uh, I would be bundled up with, uh, and my computer would actually freeze in the middle of class. So we all dealt with various challenges. Next slide, please. And then I have several undergraduate researchers that have helped me throughout uh, my time at Tech. And this isn't even updated because I think I have 11 students this semester um, that, have all, that are all contributing to a lot of these projects and helping them be successful. So I think we'll go one more slide. So a lot of what you saw today is, are these beautiful science illustrations. So Ben Selleb is an uh, undergraduate student at Tech that is now a PhD student in Saad Bama's lab. Uh, and he works on camera traps. And we've been working on a lot of this conservation technology stuff. But you know, casually in his free time, he'll be like, yeah, Andrew, I whipped up something. Uh, what do you think of this? And I'm like, I'm, I mean, that's amazing. Um, so a lot of these scientific illustrations, if not all, have been done by Ben. And then I think you can just go ahead and fly through the next few. So this is my lab. Um, all of uh, my committee, and then one more. And it's my family. So uh, the fifth wheel uh, of the Schultz family. So they've been really supportive. So I have an academic family. So I'm really excited because in a year, uh, we'll be able to say that it's uh, Dr. Andrew Schultz, Dr. Kirk Schultz, Dr. Noel Schultz, and Tim, my older brother. So um, that's, uh, that's the joke I'm really excited for. So with that, um, I think the next slide is questions, hopefully. 
Yeah, and so that is my email as well as my Twitter handle. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I know we bulldoze through a lot of stuff. I didn't even talk about skin because I didn't think I would have time. But uh, thank you so much for having me. And with that, I will take any questions.